I'm very excited to be here today to talk about walking and running. It's something I've been very interested in for a lot of years. Uh, I'm going to tell you today how we learn from animals, our best example of uh, machines that are capable of getting around in the world today, how we interpret uh, experiments uh, and observations of animals into math models. And the diagram on the slide is, is a representation of the physics that we think we understand. And then how we take that interpretation, that understanding of what animals do, and implement it on machines, on robots. So I'll start by asking you, the audience, a question. What is walking and what is running? Now, the dictionary definitions are pretty clear. In the dictionary, it says you walk at a, it's a slow pace with one foot on the ground at a time, OK? And running is when you speed up, and at some point, you're going to have both or all of your legs off the ground in, at a time in, in the case that you're, you have four legs. But um, now let's define it for a robot and uh, maybe take a step back and say, let's first define foot for a robot, OK? These things are not well defined when you think about a machine. If you think of a robot that's very, very simple, perhaps something shaped like an egg, OK? And it's going pretty fast, and it's taking a little hop with each roll. So all of its feet are off the ground, uh, and it's moving forward. Um, I think most people would recognize that's not running. So. Our goal is not to meet some definition of walking or to run by a dictionary definition. Our goal is to meet or exceed animal performance. Now, there are many aspects to animal performance. Animals work off of carrots or pizza. They don't take a lot of energy to get around, OK? They don't take a full tank of gasoline the way a car does. Animals are agile. Part of that is versatility. Animals go up and down stairs, climb mountains, walk seamlessly or run from sand to pavement, run through unexpected potholes, such as you see right here, OK? Very robust. They just don't fall very often. If you think about um, a mountain goat, if a mountain goat falls, it's probably done for. So they don't fall, <laughs> you know? That's pretty reliable. That's pretty robust. Uh, and robots are nowhere near that, just nowhere near. Now, in this animal experiment, this video that you see, um, the bird has no idea that this dip in the ground is coming. It has run down this runway 100 times uh, with tissue paper over a flat surface, and it expects to just run right on down the runway. And this hole is about 40% the length of the leg. So that's a really big dip, and it just doesn't slow this animal down very much. So we really want to understand how they do this. Now, when we look at animals to try and understand these things, we're not looking at a specific animal. We're looking at all animals. We're trying to find trends. We're trying to find universal truths, things that are consistent among all types of animals. Birds just happen to be very good at running, something that uh, can be, exp can be uh, tested in the laboratory pretty well. So if we can understand these fundamental principles that work for ghost crabs and horses and humans and guinea fowl and ostriches, uh, these principles are going to apply equally to robots as well and something we're going to be able to implement. Now, an important point I want to make is that understanding these principles is very different from trying to reproduce their morphology. So we're not particularly interested in human-like knees versus bird-like knees or the shape of the foot or exactly where all the tendons and bones and muscles are. That differs, but the basic principles behind what that shape is implementing doesn't really change. Now, I'd like to point out that walking is really not as simple as it may seem. It's so common, right? You see insects skittering across the ground all the time. A giraffe is born walking. How can it possibly be that hard? But there is a lot of evolution built in behind this, OK? If we really understood how walking and running work, if we really could write down the answer, like write down an equation or several that describe this is the definition of walking and running, we would have robots everywhere doing this. They would be just, you know, wheels are everywhere. That's pretty simple. Legs are a little more complicated. But motors are strong enough, okay? Materials are light enough and strong enough. Uh, computers are fast enough. All of these things, the technology, is there. 
That is not the limiting factor. Our basic understanding of how walking and running works is the limiting factor. So this, I want to point out, is the very best <laughs> we can do. Um, <laughs> okay, so let me, let, me temper, let me temper the humor a little bit by pointing out that this is the DARPA Robotics Challenge. This was inspired by, <laughs> hold on. This was inspired by the Fukushima Daiichi power plant disaster, okay? So the tsunami that went in through the power plant and caused a nuclear meltdown, the government said, do we have any robots that can go into this radiation-saturated environment? And there weren't. There were no robots that could go upstairs or through a door. And then DARPA funded, with many millions of dollars, the very best teams in the world, all around the world, <laughs> to build these, OK? So moving on, <laughs> we need to do better than that, right? I mean, that was a very expensive blooper reel. We don't want to see the robots falling all the time. We want to see robots that are capable and can really get around in the world. Now, if we can really understand walking and running, OK, and we can understand legs, the impact is going to be huge. Now, to start with, I hope, my belief is, that wheelchairs are going to be an anachronism of history. Everybody is going to be able to have an exoskeleton that is not much of an imposition at all, that runs all day on a battery charge, and gets people up and out of wheelchairs and walking around. That's a huge impact, OK? We're going to have prosthetic limbs, powered prosthetics, that are going to allow the machine leg, the robot leg, to operate like the biological leg, and allow a person to be just as good as able-bodied. But I think that the greatest impact of understanding leg and locomotion is going to be the integration of robots in our lives and in society. Robots that can go wherever a person can go, up and down stairs and through doorways and all of those things. A couple of examples. One, of course, is a disaster scenario. This graphic in the uh, bottom of my slide here is from DARPA showing how they imagine robots might have gone into the power plant, seen that there was a gas leak, and turned off a valve. And that would have made it much less of a disaster, and it would have released much less radiation into the environment if they could have done that. You might imagine a fire chief looking at a burning building, and they don't know if anybody is still in there. They think maybe, but it's dangerous to go in. Do you send your firemen into the building to try and save people who may or may not be there? It's a tough choice. But if it's a robot, no problem. You send the robot in. And the robot is capable of doing that. Today, we don't have anything that can. And then uh, imagined in the movie iRobot, there's the FedEx robots, right? Package delivery. Robots all over the place doing things. So the impact, I think, is going to be huge. We're just beginning to understand this. It's been a long time coming. Um, and we're just starting to understand that walking and running are both an integration of passive dynamics and applied control. So by passive dynamics, I mean the behaviors of, say, the unconscious person. It's your tendons, your muscles, your bones. It's how you move when you're not doing any work with your muscles. It's how a robot moves when the power is off. Those are the passive dynamics. And those can either help your performance or really impede your performance. You know, I try to teach my students that no matter what software you write, you cannot program a rock to fly. The um, passive dynamics are what they are, and they can limit you in that case. Uh, and then the applied control, of course, is any sort of pumping or pushing or actuation. Now, when you think about a swing, which is, should be familiar to everybody, you can pull the swing back and let it swing, and it's pretty much just a pendulum. Those are the passive dynamics. But when you want to lean back and forward and pump the swing a little bit, you're adding a little bit of energy. That's an applied control, which you need to do in a very particular way. You have to pump at just the right time. So what you're doing is nudging those passive dynamics. Your active control and your passive dynamics are working together as an integrated system. That's the way I see walking and running. And I'll describe that in more detail here. So an example from animals, here's a gibbon swinging, brachiating, OK? This is very much a pendulum but not entirely, he can't miss, right? So he's got to steer it. 
Now watch, it took a couple of steps right there at the top. That shows there's a pretty close relationship between brachiating and running. They're really very similar in how they link the, uh, the dynamics uh, from passive elements and active elements. Now here's an even better example of passive dynamics. So this is a trout swimming upstream entirely passively behind a rock. This is actually a dead trout, okay? There is no active control going on at all. All of the motion of the trout here is based on the shape of the body, based on the compliance or the stiffness of the muscles, uh, and fluid dynamics and how that passive dynamics of the fish interact with the fluid of the water around it. Now, if the fish were alive, it could keep itself in the right place so that it really doesn't take any effort to stay there and to stay stable behind that rock. So you really do need both. Okay, so for walking and running, this is the specific set of passive dynamics that we, that we look at, this uh, spring mass model. This is something that has existed for many years from the biomechanics community. Uh, biomechanists have uh, used this model to describe how animals walk and run. We added a little bit of complexity to this, some internal damping and a little bit of uh, a motor right there to add energy to describe a little bit of detail about the, uh, the, the measurements off of the birds. And this plot at the top is from our collaborators, uh, Monica Daly at the Royal Veterinary College, studying quail, pheasant, guinea fowl, turkeys, and ostriches. Hundreds of experiments, lots of statistics, all boiled down to this one plot, where we show that this spring mass model really captures what we see and what we measure from the animals, okay? So then we take that theory, that model, and in the center there, we show that we can reproduce the basic dynamics for walking and running and we can start to apply control to this passive dynamics in the model to do continuous transitions between them and show some of the behaviors, but actually implement it and not just have an observation and make a guess, we're actually implementing it in the simulator a little bit. Then we take that theory, that simple model, and we start to implement it on the robot, okay? We start to turn that into something that can become a machine. So the point is, we're not trying, we're not looking at a bird, copying the location of the muscles and joints and putting it on a robot. We're understanding how a bird works. We're implementing that idea and that theory into a machine using, we're not using muscle and bone and brain, we're using carbon fiber, aluminum motors and computers. So the shape and size may look quite a bit different, even if it's implementing the same principles. And this is, uh, this is the machine that we have developed, Atreus. Now, Atreus is an, ac an acronym for assume the robot is a sphere. Okay, and the reason that acronym exists is showing that we designed and built the machine specifically to implement as closely as possible this ideal spring mass model as we could. We did everything we could think of to make this robot, the passive dynamics of the machine, be just like this ideal model. The idea is then we can just assume that it really is that simple model and all our controllers are gonna work on it. This is really different from how a lot of robots are built, where you build a machine with all the motors in everywhere, then you try to understand what its dynamics are and try to control it. That may not work. But here, we can just assume the robot is a spring mass system and, and implement it. So we've created an integrated system here between the passive dynamics and the control. Now here it is in the beginning, okay? These are the uh, renderings we put in our proposals, the early designs. And uh, the very first prototype, just a single leg, so we could have it moving and start hopping around the lab and start practicing some of our, some of our engineering. Now here we are with another revision in another year or two, okay? It's a lengthy process. Uh, another prototype, the Atreus 2.0, we built a single leg of that, tested that hopping around, verified that we're in the right direction. And then our final revision here, the uh, Atreus 2.1 biped design on the, on the side. We start machining parts. A lot of machine shops in town participated in this and contributed uh, a lot of pieces. And we ended up building three robots. Uh, one of them we keep here at Oregon State. One of them was sent to our collaborator, Jesse Grizzle at the University of Michigan. Another to our collaborator, Hartmut Geyer at Carnegie Mellon and their labs. So those robots are still, still there. We also sent one of our machines to London our collaborator, uh, Monica Daly, there to do some comparisons to the birds that they have at the Royal Veterinary College, run it over a force plate, and that was fun. 
And here we are starting our controls, okay? So the robot is stepping in place. It's basically standing in place or, or walking in place. There are no feet on the robot because I don't know how feet work, okay? <laughs> Remember that model we're implementing is a mass and a spring, and that's it. So this robot has pretty close to point feet. And if you want to empathize with the robot, imagine you're wearing stilts and your upper body is rolled up in a carpet so you, your arms are pinned and you can't see anything, <laughs> okay? So you always have to keep stepping and then you don't know when, but somebody's giving you a kick every now and then, right? <laughs> or throwing balls at you. So, <laughs> in this example, the reason we do this, the reason we are throwing the balls at it, is to show, you know, my students don't have the greatest aim. Uh, so they... <laughs> So they did, knock, they did not successfully knock the robot over, they just turned it off, okay? <laughs> but these disturbances are completely random. There's no real planning to exactly where that happens. Now this is just a, a very similar uh, random disturbance, okay? The robot is walking over ground that it thinks is flat. But we've put these pieces of plywood down just completely randomly. There's no vision on the robot, there's no sensing, nothing. So this is a test of the robustness the same way as giving the robot a push is. And we just kind of go fast back and forth in the lab here to test it out. And we took it outside to the stadium here, started a walk, and we accelerate gradually up to a running game, just like we were able to show in the theoretical model. And then a controlled slowdown to walking in place, in the end zone, of course, right? Now, there's one small change in our controller here, and that's just that the robot is high-stepping. But it still doesn't know this obstacle's in place. So this is when you really step on an unexpected step. You're going downstairs, and there's one too few or one too many steps. That's what the robot is experiencing right now. And this is not something that we plan this behavior explicitly. It's not a trajectory that we create. We've created this general behavior of the controller and the passive dynamics. We were as surprised about this as anybody when we see it take this big step up and down. We were very excited about this. Now here is our achievement, okay? The examples, the movie, the robot walking is, is compelling, but why does it matter what's important and how is it gonna have longevity? Um, Atreus is the first machine to reproduce human gait dynamics. The plots shown here are the ground reaction forces. So we had my PhD student, Christian Hubicki, walk over a force plate on the ground to measure exactly the forces in the vertical direction. And then we walked Atreus over that exact same plate. And we show that the force profiles are the same. Now this is an outcome rather than something that we created. So we did not control the forces of the leg to match the human walking gait. This is something we observed after we had successful walking with the robot. To us, this is a really important piece of evidence that we're on the right track. If we can continue down this path, we're starting to capture the basic physics, the fundamental principles of walking and running, and we're going to be able to reproduce the performance of animals. That's our goal, that's our hope. So coming up next, right, Atreus, uh, is semi-retired at this point. It's had a lot of miles. Uh, we have a new project and we are building a robot, Cassie. Cassie's gonna be able to do a lot of things Atreus couldn't. We're building up a lot of lessons learned, very important lessons learned. This robot will not need any sort of tether. We'll be able to steer very well. We hope to take Cassie out in the woods outside, walk around, take hikes. Uh, we're developing new transmissions for this machine. And I'll just illustrate the point that motors are strong enough here. This is our prototype transmission swinging around a two and a half kilogram piece of iron, okay? And then my student goes to try and hold it still, has a hard time. This has got a lot of strength. Uh, and then <laughs> when we turn it off, it just goes limp, which is a lot more human-like than most robots. That's exactly the kind of behavior we want. So we're really excited about the possibilities here with Cassie. So the technology is progressing. Now, how can we take this out of the laboratory? Now, we've just started a company 
Agility Robotics to do that, to find applications for this technology and to start working towards market. So imagine how things are going to be in the future. That's what we're doing when we start this company. One of the big things that we imagine being able to do is logistics and package delivery. Uh, a fleet of autonomous cars, which is certainly going to exist at this point. I think it's clear to everybody that autonomous cars are coming, and that's exciting, right? So if we have uh, autonomous UPS trucks and they're going to pull up in front of your house, that last 50 feet going up and down stairs, through hedges, over tree roots, by the family dog, all of that sort of thing is not going to be done by wheels. Um, flying drones are not going to deliver 50-pound bags of dog food, right? Uh, legs can. Legs can go anywhere a person can go. Legs can do it for the same amount of energy a person can. There's no physical reason it can't. We have the example of it happening, so we know it's possible. So I think what I'll leave you with, the question is, what will it be like when robots can go anywhere that humans can go? Because we're going to find out. Thank you for your time.